you want to know? What guests we have on the show? Wake up and let's go To the Mind This Morning Show Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Mindless Morning Show. I'm your host, Josh, and we have Dakota with us as always. Back. Say hi, Dakota. Hey, everyone. Yeah, I'm back. Glad to be back. <laughs> so, now uh, engaged. <laughs> we, oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the yeah. engaged, man. Game over. So. I know. Yikes. Well, <laughs> with us today, we have a very, very special guest. We have an award-winning music biographer and author of over 50, pu- well, with over 50 published books since 2001, Jake Brown, how you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing good, guys. Thanks again for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah, Happy to have you. It, it's uh, definitely an honor because you got a lot of things. I mean, first off, you've accomplished a lot of things, but you have even more things coming up. Like, you, you're just nonstop. Yeah, yeah man. Um, I started out uh, when I was 21. I moved to L.A. like everybody out of college. My drum set, I play six instruments by ear and been a band since I was a young teenager. And I grew up playing music, so I didn't never have any ambition to be a book writer. But I started out working for a record label right after I got out there. Cleopatra Records. Thank you, Brian Pereira. And uh, from that, I saw because I was an executive assistant to just everyone in every department. I worked for free five days a week. And then I just work nights after rehearsals to like pay bills. But it was like a weird time because it was sort of when the internet was around, but not really a digital downloading hadn't even really started yet. But I got to see how like hard working everybody is, even when they make something out of whatever they want to do, like a band has one hit now they got to have another. Mm -hmm. Um, And then one of my jobs was writing catalog copy for like Engelbert Humperdinck like records that they had bought the rights on. I was like, what is that? Like, Oh, that's called licensing. And I'm like, Oh, that's what that means. And you see that dollar bin record from like 1950, but it's been reissued. You just, and so the point being through doing all of that, and then the fluke that started me into the book business, I saw that people that did a book like every three years, and some people are really great at that. Like they take a a really digestive amount of time writing a book with somebody or researching about them. And then it comes out and if it has the right publisher and it gets a big press junket, then they can kind of write off because it takes them that long to do it. Mark, we have one of the um, authors on our, on our season three of our show, James McGrath Morris, this guy's specialty is writing about like media figures like Pulitzer and these different people. He takes three to four years of book. So, I mean, you get, but then you have other people that fall more in my end of the world where if you want to stay relevant, you have to keep writing and producing. Producing. And so now that we're in the 20, 2020s, um, this project that that kind of kicked off last summer in my mind uh, about the author's TV was something that came to me kind of in a desperate moment because I had, a, you know, 1,500, 2,000 copies just off the, uh, for Barnes and Noble orders that got canceled. <laughs> And then yeah. other retailers got kicked because it was called Behind the Words. Nash was a book that profiled all the country record producers, talks about personal interviews of their stories, stories behind their songs. I was like, man, what are we going to do? You know, we got a whole summer of promoting to do and no book to promote. And so my publicist reinvented it into Samantha Downey. Go, Samantha. Um, <laughs> she re- At the time, she reinvented it into sort of a 50th book campaign. And I did it all on Zoom. Like we're talking here. And I was like, what the yeah. hell Zoom? And then, you know, so many morning shows later, Austin, Chicago, Denver, we went all over. We did a um, zillion podcasts. And it was like, this is amazing. And I'd always wanted to interview the world's best selling authors in the same format that I do bands, either in my in the studio series. I write them in whole format books with like Hart or Lemmy before he passed the Tupac Shakur State. Or I just finished one, um, a 10 year update to the Rick Rubin in the studio, which is one of some of my best selling books in Germany. There's a prince in the studio that's out in Japan. And that publisher just hired, hired me to write a Michael Jackson in the studio in Japan. So my point is like, this is a global series, but yeah. it bases around the same concept of like chapter by chapter, each album by album interview, all the engineers, if possible, the artists, which was the case with Hart and Lemmy and some others. And then Ruben endorsed, like uh, authorized the book, but d- didn't want to, I can understand that. But we're like the only book on Rick Rubin ever in his, like in, in Nashville here. Um, it's cool. Cause I work on music row a lot. You go into these studios and I was, I wanted to like talk to Dave Cobb for his chapter in behind the words, Nashville, Chris Stapleton's guy. And I'm like, 
and on his reference <laughs> shelf as recruiter. So the point is, I kind of found these niches over uh, behind the boards in the studio. Um, my National Songwriter book series, where I interview all the best-selling songwriters. They they basically write all the hits that the Tim McGraws of the world make make big and Luke Luke Bryan's. Although Luke Bryan, to give him credit, is a legitimate songwriter. Anyway, point being, <laughs> it kind of I translated all of that. I was like, I've got to do something because this is like revolutionary technology, lightning in a bottle type stuff. And because I have 50 books to my name and I had done a lot of TV work by very fortunate luck, you do that for free and you get a lot more of it, by the way, than young kids. If you're coming up, you don't charge for it as you're the last person they're going to talk to again. But I'd done the Death Row Chronicles for BET. I'd done things for Fuse on Nikki Six, one of Bloomberg for Jay-Z, going back many years. Um, and more recent stuff, I do these Breaking the Bands now for A&E and Reels, which is that we did Heart. And then I just did Foreigner Prince and Skid Row. And it's just, you know, so taking that and being like, OK, I was watching all these Zoom shoots happening with the masks. And I was like, this could be done. So anyway, I started reaching out to authors and like amazing. And, and my attitude, and, and I think it's a piece of advice I give is like, if you're a reporter, which I'm not, but if you're a journalist, you go after the big story first and then you whittle your way down to the, you know, you got to think big and then mm -hmm. you, you're going to wind up even in the middle of that big pond of authors. I mean, and we're talking globally, but some of the first people to sign on, like we have F. Lee Bailey's last ever filmed televised interview because no one else was talking to the guy and he was 87 and i was like this guy's the best-selling defense attorney of all time and no one knows that he wrote books called for the defense oh. and the defense never rested inspired generations of lawyers he also of course with the oj case i got all this behind the scenes stuff about like you know the oj simpson people versus oj had just come out and i was like can you tell me did you really tell chris darden like what did you tell him to get him to, to goad him into the OJ to try the gloves on. Yeah. He says, I told him he had the balls of a stud field mouse, which is exactly what they said in the show. I was like, you really said, and right there <laughs> on the floor. Yeah, dude. And that got him that like he's an old Marine trick of his. And uh, this guy talked about, you know, flying to cases. And, you know, this guy defended a lot of people that were underdogs that people don't give him credit for. He got the guy out of jail who was the original inspiration for the fugitive series. And then the yeah. and then yeah Sam Shepard and then who they call Richard Kimball in the show and then the Harrison Ford movie, but anyway so that was one early one that surprised me and then Sue Monk Kid from The Secret Life of Lee Bees God bless her signed on Scott Turo from Presumed Innocent and Brad Meltzer and we just started going down the list Catherine Coulter and these authors T C Boyle Heather Graham who's the pioneer of paranormal romance uh, I'm thinking John Douglas from Mindhunter. Uh, you know, that, yeah, that was a two and a half hour one. And so I was like, I would, and I was doing research into how long these other people's interviews last week, podcast might be a half hour, 40 minutes, which is still great. 20 minutes. Make what? And they'd be like, well, they don't ask me anything. I'm like, well, what do you want to talk about? Like you guys do. We have these long format. And then what I do is we built a set that I shoot at right here locally in Hendersonville, Johnny Cash's hometown. Um, yeah. And I put it together on a shoestring because the, but it's beautiful. And the, the, the book case, you see it in the background of the episodes and I'll send you guys some to show clips of it if you want, but basically all the shelves are lined with the books of everyone we talk to. So, nice. and we switch them out for different episodes, but it's really like a format episodic format talk show where I talk with these people about, you know, when they were little kids and they first put their hands on books all the way through the creation of like foot in the door rejection letters, how they got their first book sale, how they stayed relevant for 50 decades, you know, or mm -hmm. I mean, 50 you know, years and certain people's cases. And so anyway, it really, it just took on a life of its own. And we shot 200 interviews in uh, 12 months. Yeah. And I figured I got to <laughs> grab this thing by the tail. And uh, so, yeah, we have six seasons in the bag and, and the first two are coming out together in November, uh, excuse me, in December on some streaming networks mainly in the spring though and we'll be in libraries and universities but we're rolling out episodes also on our social media about the authors tv it's on youtube TikTok, instagram everywhere i hate instagram personally because they only have minute long <laughs> if you're in an episodic format show and you can only show minute long snippets you got to yeah, do like rough. five parts you know but it's yeah. it's really been fun twitter uh uh even you know in a post-trump era has gotten a little less stigma to it but so we, we we've had the engagement of all the authors as well sharing on you know, we have the Killing Books guy that, that writes Bill O'Reilly. We have um, a bunch of TV uh, people. Uh, Neil Strauss that co-wrote the Nikki Six, excuse me, the uh, Motley Crue, the Dirt book. Uh, we have Ian Gittins who co-wrote the Heroin Diaries and Jenna Jameson, How to Make Love Like a Rock Star is known Neil Strauss book. Kevin J. Anderson who co-wrote the Dune uh, books and oh. movie that's out. Of so it mm -hmm. just really covers the stylistic spectrum. So whether you're a romance awesome. fan or 
true crime fan or science fiction where it's all covered in there. Yeah. That's awesome. And, I, and I'm not somebody who uh, typically reads too much, but I, I will say um, I really hope you happen to get uh, this this one guy, Elijah Aaron. He, he's a really good author. <laughs> we'll look him up. Yeah, no, it's this guy right here, Dakota. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I self published a book back in um, about June uh, 2020 when the Congrats. pandemic started. So what was it thanks. about? Yeah, it's a it's a sci fi um, book. It's called Barnard's Galaxy: Descendants of Legacy. Uh, my author name is DK Nova. That's a good one. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, you know, but yeah, there's, as you probably learned too, and even within the digital realm, I mean, there's so many great. You know, one of the one of the really cool messages about this show that I got from people who at this point might be in their 70s or 60s and didn't start writing until their 40s. And when they started writing, now they're 50 books in or they're in the 60s. Um, it's never too late to, to start that dream or mm -hmm. to be really much younger and do it. Uh, we have a girl named Anna Adams from France who writes this thing called the French Girl series, is YA series. She was a Wattpad star. I mean, that was like, so there's all these oh, different yeah, mediums yeah. you can publish on yeah. and you're not restricted. See, when I started out, <laughs> Tony Rose and Yvonne Rose from Amber Books, shout out. Um, I wrote for them for years, early hip hop books. I, I did a book on Suge Knight. That's still the only book on Suge nice. Knight. Uh, I hey. did Biggie, Jay-Z, 50 Cent, um, you name them. But they were of the, he was a record business background. Uh, so he really brought that hustle, you know, coming up the streets of Boston and helping discover the new kids. And, you know, so he, he we used to walk down the, the uh, BEAs, which is the book expo in New York or Chicago or whatever. And Tony's about six foot six and I'm about five foot nine, if I'm being generous. <laughs> Big cowboy hat big tall African-American guy boots from Arizona. He'd be in all black. He'd be walking down the aisle and the aisle would just part. People would be like, who is this guy? And they would think he was like an athlete or a, a rock star or somebody there. And then they, they would come over and he'd start pitching them on whatever title and sell orders to retailers right there. So I had the awesome. benefit. But yeah. Well, see, that's the thing too. Networking is so important, but as you'll learn, as you keep writing, there's so many more ways nowadays to do it than we, we used to have to walk around on the floor and pitch the paperback uh, right. uh, buyers from the retailers because that's how they were able to justify the orders. And then we would do a license at Doubleday or Japan. In my twenties, I had like four books out in Japan that were on Biggie, Tupac, Jay-Z <laughs> and 50 Cent. And I was like, this is cool, but, but there was so many magic. <laughs> But it was so old school compared to how it is now. Right. Uh, so what did you, what did you find? I'm curious because I talked to a lot of authors that start out this way that are younger that are now mm -hmm. doing really well. Did you find there was a lot more freedom to also quickly engage with readers right through all the social media? Yeah, I was gonna say I um I didn't go through like Wattpad or any of those initially. I um I kind of did my research to figure out what was the best way to go about it. So I used Ingram Spark. Um, yeah, and just kind of published. That's a good there. one. Yeah. So that's what I did and tried building up my social media and everything like that. And then once I started doing podcasts, I kind of took a break from pushing the social media side of it more, but it was cool engaging with people. Um, I did a couple of podcasts initially as like an author interview with a couple of people and stuff, but yeah, I mean, overall the experience was fun. Um, I probably would have been doing a lot better if I like stuck with it and was like, still doing everything daily posting stuff but yeah i kind of moving to kansas and everything kind of stalled it dude but. yeah i can't tell you how many authors in this thing and i'm just looking over other names we have chicken soup for the soul co-creator mark victor hansen as an example that guy sold 500 nice. million books 500 million half a billion that's, <laughs> he yeah, that's he's insane. he social media wise every day mm -hmm. is I mean, it's, and that's the thing, like the engagement factor, because there's so much competition and there's so much content that shifted yeah. with, with the COVID backdrop. That's why we, we created this in such a hurry from the standpoint of, I filmed for like a year, mm -hmm. four or five, six a week. And the idea yeah, was, let me get everyone. Well, I wanted everyone while they were stuck at home. Yeah. yeah. Because now that this is that's lifting, people are going to are going to be touring again and, and yeah. they want to see their fans and their fans want to see them. So we wouldn't have them. So what uh is that studio back there is that ray-ban that i see behind you in that case uh, yeah well i mean it's <laughs> there are no sunglasses in there it's all that's toys. awesome <laughs> what is in there dude it looks really cool <laughs> it, it's just all, a bunch of toys deadpools hellboys pops just, right just my dumb my dumb shit <laughs> yeah um dude. 
And so, I mean, you, you've definitely built up quite a, a repertoire of, of episodes. And are you releasing the first two seasons out right away? Yeah, they come out together, 54 of them. My rationale there was, again, like, why not, you know, go big or go home? And, and, and you know, we have a third season that I'm almost as excited about because it's got, like, the Martian Andy Weir writer. The, the, oh, that nice. Movie. It's got Happen Leonard creator Craig Johnson. It's got Lincoln Ryan creator uh, Jeffrey Deaver. It's got Bones TV Dang. show Kathy Reichs. It's got... That's um, insane. Dang. Yeah, it, it, Joe R. Lansdale, my God, uh, who does Happen <laughs> Leonard. is a legend. Uh, we've got... Um, so many amazing guests, but see, you know, seasons one and two, what was so cool about them. And I want to make sure I plug some of these people, you know, like, um, you know, there's romance authors in this thing that I was like, I will confess, I have not read a lot of romance books, but when my agent was like, you need to research the sales for romance. And I was like, okay, so next to science fiction, that it's the biggest selling in the world. And when I started talking to a lot of these, you know, Lori Foster, um, uh, is one that's really big. So is um, Kristen Higgins. So is um, Jemima J. Author, um, Jane Green. We have the Nanny Diaries co-creator, Nicola Krauss. Um, a lot of others, Nancy Nagel. Uh, once, we, once we started talking to them, and then you have people like Heather Graham and Catherine Coulter who started out in romance and then transitioned into FBI thriller and these things. Romance is like the Harlequin school. It's like a PhD program for writers because... You're, you're slamming them out. And it reminded me of writing hip hop books in my twenties where it was just like a couple of year, two, so, three years, and you know, you have to just bang them out, man. And, and, and literally people. Yeah. Bang literally. Them out. <laughs> and then you get these other people though, who, who write these, um, you know, Kevin Maurer, we have the gentleman, Kevin Maurer on the show who co-wrote the no easy day book with Mark Owen on the bin Laden raid. Um, we have John Douglas, as I mentioned before, from Mindhunter. And if uh, George Anastasia is, is a mafia book writer, he writes books with like Hitman and Witness Protection and stuff like that. And like, yeah, man. And so there's so many people on this show that that cross Steve Alton, the creator of the Meg Shark movie oh, franchise. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you really, really are taken behind the scenes of how any genre that you're a fan of, true crime, mystery, suspense, thriller, um, any of them. And it shows you really candidly the mechanics that go into staying a hit author. And, and that was as interesting to me because I hustle. I mean, I ghostwrite probably four books a year in addition to the three that I write in my own name. Oh, wow. and, and that's on top of this. I've had to write more this year to pay for the, I've put 30 grand of my own money financing this thing because it's a professionally shot show. It's really quite cool. We're proud of it, but it took a lot of work as anything that you want to be up to a certain standard does. And then you have closed captioning, all these things, HBO flight attendant, uh, uh, creator, Chris Bahian, uh, presumed innocent. Was that the, the, of course the Harrison Ford, uh, Scott Tarot, Brad Meltzer mm. uh, does decoded and, and all these. So all these really, really top echelon, you know, people that when they talk about how hard they work behind the scenes, just to keep in touch, like, yes, I have millions of fans, but I have to stay in touch with all of them. Or yes, I have millions of fans, but every year they expect a new book and it's the same right. character. And that character has to be it's someone these people grow up with and, you know, sit through husbands with cancer with or wives with, you know, cancer or, or, or mothers and fathers dying in a hospital. And they read these books, you know, not to get super serious. We have Karen Slaughter, who's the biggest crime fiction author in the world right now. She was talking about that i mean the the amount of commitment that it takes beyond just the creative to stay competitive nowadays because of there's so much competition from the young generations coming up um yeah. is really 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 something that was important to drive home because there is an academic audience to this show too there's the fan of the writers who want to just know about oh wow i didn't never knew that about that book or that writer or that character or that um circumstance that inspired the book or what have you but man if you want to to learn. I mean, and that's why we're hoping the university kind of aspect in, in high schools, there's just no downside to show, you know, it'd be really cool to have like an hour to sit, sit there. And I'm only on the screen long enough for a little bit. And then we show book jackets and then I'm back for a sec, but it really lives up to the title about the author's uh, TV. It's really about it. There are 90% of the, of the, the hour you're spending with them right in their writing room, right where they create, but there's so many lessons and, and, and that anyone, in any age of the process and be like, like, as an example, you might be a younger author and I'm an older author and I'm just coming back into it. Or, you know, cause I spent three years working on that opus that I, is my, you know, you're going to be a lot more hip into the new, like 
I didn't know what the hell TikTok was before <laughs> a month ago. And, and we've now got a ton of videos up and we're adding every yeah. day. And I hated Twitter. I had a Twitter account that it was every six months. My publishers had forced me to put something on it. And now I, on the show's Twitter page, I work it every day. You know, we're putting up videos. We're, it, so it's an amazing community, but you have got to stay connected into it. And you've got to work seven days a week, man. That's the, yeah, it's you're right the every day. Consistency, man. The consistency. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys I hate it. I hate social media. <laughs> yeah, so I do I do too except when you have when you I do only from the standpoint that it's a lot of it's just an obligatory daily thing but when you yeah. look past the obligation that there's real people that are engaging with you Great. that are interested in something that you created like you guys show yeah, you might have to stay up an extra 2 hours answering emails but those are people who are listening to you. That's and true. we hope are watching. And, and that's what makes it cool, because if we didn't have that, it would be like, you know, a desert or you wouldn't have any idea who your who your readers were, your listeners were. So anyway, I, I embraced it because it's uh, it, it everything's different now. We're living in a different world. We're living in finally the real digital age. You know, remember, like we we're growing up, they had Under Siege in like 91 and Steven Seagal's uh, guy. They're sitting there on the video com on the battleships and all that. And. <laughs> Yeah. They didn't have that released to the public until Skype and, and FaceTime. And those are not really, you can't really film like you can with Zoom on those with the, with the quality of Zoom. It's like, we're now finally getting the access to the technology the rest of the world and the military's had for years. Not to be conspiratorial, yeah. but it, it's really like, why didn't this come around sooner? Because it's completely changed the landscape and possibilities of, of talking to people. Uh, and not for five minutes, man, but for a really fundamental deep dive. You know, Sue Monk Kid and I, two and a half hours, we edited it down to two. John Douglas went two hours. We talked about every serial killer that he ever went into a prison and talked to. And how is it different from the show? And <laughs> this guy is awesome. And he loves to talk. So if you're a true crime fan, if you are a science fiction fan, Kevin J. Anderson, we talk about the X-Files, Star Wars, Saga, Seven Sons, the oh, Dunes, yeah. the Neil Peart stuff. So you get the full nice. catalog um, from all these people. It's really fun. I was really proud of it. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely going to check it out. It sounds right. Up my yeah. Mind. And we I'm keep it moving, it man. Stuff. It's not boring. It's got kind of a, it's got kind of a PBS vibe, but again, it's got that late night letterman thing. I'm not going to allude to so specifically, <laughs> but it's got a wide range of potential audiences that could all enjoy it. Awesome. And uh, like I said, you're really hearing straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, the authors, I don't want to call them horses, but you're hearing from, from the souls and hearts and mouths of these people who spend so many hours in solitary behind a computer. Mm -hmm. And then they come out and they really talk about the truth behind a lot of the sort of fiction of these books. There's a lot of like art imitating life. You know what I mean? There's a lot. And that's really for fans of these authors too. You might have read that. You might not have watched it, though. And since we're living in such a visual medium now, people can, you know, there's going to be an audiobook version of this out in the spring. I think through Audible, we're still working that out. But um, nice. so if you're just driving and you can't watch, but you want to listen. So it really covers every base. Kiki Friedman, uh, who is Texas country music legend, uh, he ran for governor and got, uh, gosh, I think 20 percent of the vote. And uh, yeah, when he ran and, and I met him outside a songwriter thing in, in Austin, it was like, uh, what do you think about doing a interview for this book for me? And then we expanded that to this and he's never done a book, an interview on his writing career before. So like, okay. and that's the other thing I was lucky with. So like Lawrence Block and some of these people in their eighties, their minds are still so amazing, but they can look back over six decades, man. Like, tell you what it was like in the 50s and in the 60s and the 70s and how the business changed and how different things were done when they had print presses and how it worked when you had to like mail in the 800 page um, manuscript like in mm -hmm. the boxes and what if FedEx loses one and that's like a third of the book and just all kinds of crazy stories. Damn. Yeah, that is crazy I to think about that. And to have, yeah, to have 54 episodes out right away, there's not there's nobody that cannot find an episode to watch for them it sounds like yeah man and we have these previews right now too that are on the youtube channel about the author's tv it's on youtube and it's um which i love god bless youtube and they are 10 minute 12 minute 15 minute uh previews of every one of the episodes you can also go to about the authors tv.com and you click on any author face takes you right to their bio and shows you the same preview and you can just scroll through and watch them. We've made it. So hopefully those little tastes, cause you know, w w the tricky thing again with us getting into these issues with, well, so-and-so network's going to carry it, but it's 3D network, but it's not going to be till 
February or January. It's like, all right, well, how, we could talk to death about the show. But if, so you can also, I think as of next week, um, by the time this airs, you can buy individually every episode for two ninety nine dollars right off the website and download it. And it's yours and it's super cheap for what you're getting in the content sense. Um, and then you can also buy the whole thing for 30 bucks on uh, a nice. bunch of retail or digital sites that'll be up. Just okay. download it straight out. So, I mean, it's impossible that you, if you want to watch it, it's there um, to watch. Uh, and, and, and like, again, the reason we did it like that, where you can individually watch them is I'm completely realistic to the fact that like my mom is a, not going to want to read about like, uh, wait, we have David Morell in season three who created Rambo. So to my generation, that's like, <laughs> I want to watch that one first. Yeah. She was, I know she's not going to want to watch that so she can skip it. Yeah. It's like, you can, you, you can just check out what you want to check out. And uh, you know, this, um, yeah. there's guys like in the first season, I'm just looking at this list that are more even sort of artsy, um, intellectual, like TC Boyle is a really thought provoking author, but also somebody like William Boyd is a British author. Uh, writes books about all these international backdrops. There's all kinds. Man, I just covered Laurie R. King takes you back into Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes. Um, the Enola Holmes uh, series on Netflix is a big deal. We have Nancy Springer who created that. So no matter what corner you want to turn in, Joseph Fender did this paranoia and high crimes movies, Love Wins. Beverly Jenkins is a legendary African-American author of historical fiction. Um, there just there's, a, there's a, something for everybody there. And we hope that even if you only want to watch one of them, that you'll watch it because it's entertaining. Absolutely. And if you like that, that's a fun thing about the $30 price. We set it. So it's like almost impossible. It's like 50 cents an episode. If you monetize it right, down yeah. to what you're spending and you then maybe you're bored on a Saturday and you're doing laundry or whatever you're doing and you can have it on the background. You might pick up a new interest in a new kind of book or someone that you didn't realize wrote that book. So there's all kinds of hopeful discovery and surprise within it. And if you're an aspiring author, which is a big part of our target audience, like I said, you can listen to these authors talk about their process and it's not nerdy. It's really honest about, you know, I have arthritis, so I'm 45 and, and I have early onset rheumatoid arthritis. My dad's got. So for me typing, I can type, but I feel it like at the end of the day, really hardcore, like there's people that are in their seventies are doing it. And they're like, Sonny, you got nothing on, you know, I mean, so you just really get these war horse kind of attitudes of people who continue to do it. Um, and they talk about the loneliness of it. And they talk about, you know, Neil Strauss talks about going on the road with Motley Crue. Um, and, and I've been a crew head since I was, I don't know, I'm 45. I was born in 76 and I started seeing them on the feel good tour. So that was when I was 13. So, I mean, I've been watching them in arenas since then, you know, theaters and then back to arenas and now a stadium next year. But if you're a real crew fan or you discovered them through the Dirt movie. This guy co-wrote that. If you're a Nikki Six fan, you got the Heroin Diaries author. You got Rob Halford. Uh, there's a lot of me so there's rock and roll in this thing. There's there's murder mystery in this thing. There's bloody serial killer stuff in this thing. If you <laughs> really want to go hardcore, uh, F. Lee Bailey and and John Douglas will take you there. And George Anastasia will tell you what it's like to write a book with a real life hitman and witness protection. Um, that's so covers about that's every quarter. Yeah, I was like, that's fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. you get the Dune story, you get everything Co covering um, any and all spectrums. I, I mean, man, yeah. you you gotta get a uh, we gotta we gotta get you Howard Bloom on there, man. Yeah, we have a list that that he's on and some others, man. That uh, and that's the thing that was also really cool is so many bigger name people that I desperately needed to establish just so signed on really fast. And part of it's because at 50 books as a host, I at least know the pains of the process so I could talk to them honestly about it. And then when I re-edit those Zoom answers cut in with my react Q and A's on my set, it cuts down a lot of me just to the core, boom. And then they talk for however long they want to talk. Um, and you really, really get down to, to go down the rabbit hole with them. And, you know, authors are by nature really quirky in some cases, you're going to see an exterior that's like soccer mom. But then when they start talking about books, they're like, yeah, when I'm cooking, I'm mumbling aloud to myself, my kids, because and they just know not to interrupt mom because I'm writing out. Like, it's just amazing yeah. to hear how the characters, especially, you know, some of the fascinating things that you guys would probably get a kick out too. is like, imagine if you live with a character in a series setting, like Rusty Savage for Scott Turow for 30 years or, um, so many examples, Dismas Hardy for John Lesquallitz, and this has been around, Lawrence Block's written Scudder, Keller, the hitman, which is my favorite one. Um, 
you have these characters that live in these people's heads for decades yeah. and they really become part of them. Um, not in to say a sort of creepy way, but in a really, uh, yeah, they just, they become, <laughs> yeah, man. And, and then whenever it's time to sit down, uh, Richard Sharp, I'm looking at Bernard Cornwell here. Um, and then whenever they sit down to write that character again, it's almost like having a creative multiple personality disorder. It sounds like and it would not like in a bad way, but you have to like tap into that yeah. person and, and all their quirks, which may be completely different from yours and assume their identity on page in a way that has to be completely authentic with the reader to the same level, every book in and out. Think of the stress that would be. And then think about things like, I never thought about growing up reading series, like, gosh, they age this character every book versus some characters you read and they stay the same. Um, right. You know, we had a James Bond author here, William Boyd, that I just mentioned, he wrote one of the millennium James Bond books solo. I was like, how'd you do that? You know? And he went, well, I took him back to the war back when he was a, a young lad and this and that. And I was like, oh. and so they, to hear how they assume we have a, a Barry Eisler in season three and he wrote the Indiana Jones book, the most recent one. So mm -hmm. how did you, you know, you have to kind of assume the headspace of these people. So it's really fascinating to hear how they do that. Um, Kevin J. Anderson, basically like a, like Andy, we're two were like scientists and they really studied like they got the PhDs or were at laboratories and writing at night. And they were literally taking all the real science and, and putting it into these books as they were developing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so it really yeah. gave them a cutting edge to understand um, how to do all that. Tess Gerritsen is a, a Rizzoli and Isles is a TV show she does, but she's a medical doctor that writes medical thrillers. And so you get really get the sense of how the real lives bleed into the, the work. So, yeah, so you're the you're the guy to go to if uh, we we want to talk to any of these authors. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I've been very lucky in most of their most cases. I'm in direct touch with them or their people. So yeah, absolutely. We have a husband wife team. Faye and Jonathan Kellerman. Um, he's like a forensic psychologist. It's interesting okay. to talk to a forensic psychologist. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so some of the guests, as you guys can appreciate, um, they also really have to become historians of whatever their particular medium is. And so you get to like talk to them about, well, what did, what was that research curve? Like, she's like, well, I went to school. I went, like, I always want to know from like Catherine culture or um, who does a Brit in the FBI with JT Ellison. They're both in this season and others. I want to know how do you credibly write the FBI dialogue and how they speak and, you know, and they're like, well, they have these things at the FBI Academy. We'll let authors come and they almost give you like a three week crash training course or you go to a local police um, kind of okay. citizen academy or you do ride alongs. But then you want to go to the morgue and you hang out with the while well, they're cutting up the bodies all night. And just to get the authentic flavor of what it smells like and looks like and how the <laughs> things pull open and stuff that's unsettling to me, but that, they want uh... it to be authentic. And so you hear about all these these commitments to process, man. It really requires them to as assume the identity of these characters, even in the research in ways mm. that are like, you know, ballsy, you know what I yeah. mean? They really, not to, sure. I guess that term in the me too era is whatever, but that it takes a lot of courage to go out and do what they do <laughs> and dig that deep. So it's authentic for the reader. Brad Meltzer talked about um, with his history series, he got to take the nine 11 flag and I was in New York on nine 11. I was on a pretty day, not at the trade center, but I was in Manhattan and lived in Brooklyn and saw the towers in the morning and the night before. And then the next night gone. So walked across yeah. the bridge cause you couldn't take the subways. And he found this flag, this very famous flag. That the firefighter gave, I think it was a W or it was, it was like an important flag and it disappeared. They found it and returned it to the nine 11 museum. He talks about all the history that he's been able to kind of introduce new generations and I don't know. It's cool. You get all these different perspectives from these amazing minds with right. that are almost like the matrix to me, you know, like you remember the matrix, the original ones with the <laughs> grid and you're like, that oh, must yeah. be what a mind looks like when it's thinking to me, it was like, you know what I mean? And these people really take on other dimensions, man. It's fascinating to, to go inside their heads. Yeah. That's, that's super cool. cool. You get to talk to all of them. I, I would definitely love to, to do like a ride along or something just to get it, it reminds me of that uh the tv show i used to watch castle where he was yeah. nathan Fielding was the author and he he's traveling around with the detective and um i i, I like that dynamic of the show so that's actually really cool to to know that authors have, have done it, it, the, podcast, you know radio show host podcast it's it's opened up now from what i understand so you guys could probably do one 
and then host your show while you're doing the ride along. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it would so honestly cool. be really cool. I, I think I'd prefer to just be like a laptop on like. Yeah, yeah you can side. just yeah, watch like, it. Like, <laughs> the Big Bang episode with the, yeah, right? Yeah. You you know. Have a computer rigged up in the back with your face on it and turn that way. Yeah. Uh, no, it, uh, but I'm yeah, man, I, I think uh, another thing that was really interesting with F. Lee Bailey um, cause he was at the age he was at, he said, ask me whatever you want. I was like, cause I'm like nerdy fan of his, you know, cause when I was a kid, the OJ, like I remember being in college and if you guys are a little younger than me, but if you grew up in the era of the 1980s where football was on and dad was watching football on Sundays, there was always this guy standing on the sideline with a microphone named OJ. And that's who would interview all the football players. And then he was in this naked gun movie series when I was still, you know, 11, 12 and, so when he killed his wife, which we all clearly know he did now, uh, but the way in which they went about arresting him and all the stuff with Mark Furman and the blood missing, and then it's the same amount that's fine later after the rain. If you lived in L.A., you know that when it rains, there is nothing left after it rains. Yeah. So there was a little bit of shadiness there. And so it was sort of like, wow, these lawyers really, really sold that, you know, because, my God, Barry Sheck, who's one of O.J.'s lawyers, founded the Innocence Project. Which gets all these people on death row. I think OJ is innocent. I think it was his kid that killed her. That's what I thought too for a lot of years was it was Jason. And then he, well, I shouldn't say that because they'll slander him. Yeah, that was alleged, right? Uh, But then if you, so then this really creepy thing (laughs) happened, right? So OJ got really, I guess, desperate enough for money that he did this, if even before the If I Did It book, Judith Reagan, and I got this story. I'm not going to tell you the author, but they wrote for her at the time and told me about this. So she went to them and was like, hey, I have this project. You want it? And this particular guy was like, no, not for a thousand miles. Do I want anything to do with that? The guy who wound up ghostwriting that if I did a book was the same guy that heard the plaintiff wail from the dog that that was like when the murder was happening. So jump forward to 2006. Judith Regan says to OJ, all right, so there's the money for the book, which we're going to wire to an offshore account so that the Goldmans can't get the advance. They apparently paid him another $3 million, which is what he had in savings while he was in prison for nine years because he put it in his NFL pension. They can't take that. Mm -hmm. That allowed that he now lives on. But that was blood money because in that interview, when you can watch it on YouTube, this dude goes into this like other zone. And I'm not like defaming him or anything, but it looks quite like... He's talking like, well, I must have woken up and, you know, for, yeah, he talks about it. And like okay. there was someone there maybe with him that helped him get rid of the clothes and the knife. And you're like, wow, this is surreal, because if he's in fact confessing, which he was more or less doing, it was like eerie because we see murder from the point of view of, you know, television and, and like or Ted Bundy where it's mm-hmm. romanticized. But I tell you. If you really want to get into that uh, in in the show, uh, John Douglas, man, Mindhunter, criminal profiling legend, the guy in which Jack Crawford from the Silence Lambs based on the Criminal Mind show, um, he takes us inside his like they were the first to do that. They were the pioneers. They went into the prisons and talked to Ed Kemper and talked to Berkowitz, son of Sam, and talked to Charlie Manson right after they were convicted. So not even years later when they've been from, and uh, they'd be like, yeah, why did crazy. what were you? Like and and so to sit there and listen to Larry Jean Bell, who was a big serial killer in the 80s. No one's heard of Gary Ridgway, Green River Killer. Um, and they ask him, like, what were you th- what were you thinking? You know, like what drove you? And they'll and he tells a lot of how the criminal mind works. And it's really chilling um, because That's you bad. get. Yeah. Not just people that kill once, like an accident or a bar fight. This is like people Fear that killers. Plot. Yeah, man. So mm-hmm. he really. If that's your thing, that episode really, and that's actually right now you can go on YouTube and that's one of our available preview episodes. You can watch the whole hour and 45 minutes. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Gein was, uh, for whatever reason, one of those, uh, historical killers that have always interested me. Yeah. And, uh, I know silence of the lambs was loosely based on that. So that, that's pretty cool. What do you guys think the, I mused about this with, uh, with John, um, I said, what is it that, what do you think fascinates the public about, like, because we were talking about BTK and he was talking about this one, this is really cool. He, it's not cool, but 
in the context that we're talking about it, it is because he had to get this guy to talk. And they were talking to the son of Sam. And at first, the guy was really skeptical of him. And he said, you know, David, right now in Kansas, I'm working on a case with a guy that calls himself Bind, Torture, Kill. And he's basically in his letters to the police referencing the son of Sam. You're his inspiration. And then he lit up and then he wanted to talk to them. And he would have to like talk about reliving details of the cases with them and all these things. But some of these guys um, design the BTK guy designed his whole career, right? He would kill and then say to the press, how many more people do I have to kill for you to give me some press? And it's really scary that, I mean, you could almost argue the, you know, the media, like sort of in that classic quote, they play sort of like when there's a tornado coming and they're like, well, it's going to wipe out all these houses. But if the weather guy's like, look at that storm. It's so amazing. All the, and it's like, you know what I mean? So yeah. to hear him talk about how it really works in these guys' minds, it's really scary because it's like manufactured. They, they really, Gary Ridgway told him he just figured he was going to go for the all-time record because no I mean, one was that, catching That's him. one way to go about Damn. it. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it, I'm not glorifying serial killers in any respect, but <laughs> Don Douglas does take you inside their minds pretty in depthly, even in this conversation from his point of view of having to adopt how they think to kind of predict and project on how others might do it. And then their ultimate goals to try to catch them. You know, there's a funny moment and this is funny when, and it's not mine, it's in the BTK police interview when they caught him. And he's still in his little dog catcher outfit or whatever. And he's sitting there and he's asking them why they lied to him about the disc and if they could trace it. And he's saying, cause he wanted to catch you, you know? Yeah. And they're saying, just admit it, you know, just say who you are, you know? And, and they finally get him to, to admit that he's BTK. And they're like, what? Like, why? And he couldn't at first explain it. There was this weird, you know what I mean? I think the celebrity mm-hmm. thing and the, 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 the whole weird thing in our culture with being famous, you know, in, in a kind of notorious way that makes people do these really great. And, if, you know, like you mentioned, what was the name of the gentleman you mentioned? Ed Gein. Ed Gein. Yeah. How many people, if you ask the top five serial killers, they're going to say they're going to say Green River, Bundy, um, this crazy bastard from Los Angeles that, that uh, they just caught the old guy, Gold State. The Golden State. Oh, killer. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know what I mean? There's four or five that, that you're going to say. You might remember Ed, Ke- and that's the thing with Mind Hunters. Like, well, does Mind Hunter help further celebrate these guys in a certain sense for the people that want to? Yeah, I don't know. There was a show called The Following that I loved. I'll confess that Kevin Williams Williamson wrote that um, did had done Scream and had Kevin Bacon as an FBI agent and James Purfoy as a serial killer, and it was pre- it's a pretty solid show. The first two seasons, the third is garbage. But anyway, <laughs> don't watch it if you're a fan. Uh, you Absolutely. will not want to see the third season, but it, it. So anyway, this that episode takes you really into a deep dive. Oh. And another one we have available right now is Steve Alton, uh, the Meg writer, and and that takes okay. you down into the shark sort of. How do sharks think? I want to know that. Like when you're writing from a shark's perspective on the page, how do how do you think like a shark? And I, I just said watched other interviews, and and he really hadn't been asked that the way I was hoping to get the answer. And you don't always get that. Nobody, you're not trying to be original, but there are areas you right. can see where, yeah, you want to know a little more. And he said, he, he said, well, I just assumed how they thought and felt. And I was like, but did you do like deep sea diving? And he's like, no, I just did a bunch of research at the library. He's like, what an amazing mind to be able to take like Michael Crichton. Remember what would have been cool to talk to him if he hadn't passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, to, how do you think like a dinosaur? You know, so it's so many amazing things authors have to do that it's like Stephen King with Cujo. How do you think from the point of view of a dog? Right. You don't want to kill the boy because the boy was really good to you, but you're going to kill the owner, the, the adult, because he beat you, you know. So it, I don't know. It's fascinating. And these guys tell and the women and women, ladies and gentlemen, tell you about all of it in depth about the author's TV, www.aboutthosetv.com, about the author's TV, YouTube, Facebook, which you go to Facebook if you want, but we're really excited about Twitter and we're excited about uh, TikTok and we're excited about YouTube because you can see real length video there. I mean, even TikTok's three minutes, but you could take 10 yeah. minutes and break it into three clips and it, you know, That's so awesome. yeah, man. Yeah. And we'll, we'll definitely have all the uh, links down below in the descriptions for, yeah, I appreciate it on both YouTube and the audio so that if anybody is listening, watching, they can, and they're they're interested they can check it out but we'll definitely also sure. be uh doing some 
hardcore social media postings for you. Oh, I appreciate it. Do you, do you guys think I could tell you about like uh, two more minutes of stuff that's I've got coming up on the bookend? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. There's some man. really cool projects, man, that, that I've no. been working on. <laughs> I don't see it. Dude. My, mom just, my mind will not let me let me rest. So I'm, I'm like, you've got to put it places. And so there's a, a summer camp that I went to as a kid for six years and 25 years of people went to. And it's one of the more undergroundly famous Midwestern summer camps called 40 legends. And I finally approached a family a few years ago and got them to, uh, they were excited about it. That so these, so the book is called 40 legends. It's, I think it's one of the first authorized summer camp books, like about a summer camp and it's told from year one to the end. We like tell it through the stories of campers and it's really kind of a cool, unique project, but I'm also working on, uh, if you're a death row fan, death row records and specifically Snoop Dogg and the dog pound, I have, we're working on corrupts book right now. Oh, um, nice. okay. it's a really cool. Yeah. It's a really cool project. It's untitled, but we've been writing that for about six months. Um, and there's some other really cool stuff coming up. There's the third a national songwriter, uh, which has, has 500 pages. It has 31 chapters um, and, and songwriters, legendary older guys that take you back through 50, 60, 70 years of country music. And um, there's uh, just a bunch of cool stuff beyond the beats too, which is my rock drummer series. Um, there's a Prince in the studio coming out in audiobook in December. Um, yeah. So a bunch of good stuff. And about the author's TV, which is my main project. So I hope people watch this because I've invested a small forge. I, I basically took all my royalty checks and ghost wrote a couple of books this last year and just bankrolled it because we wanted to do it right. But it's a professionally shot show. Um, it's going to be filtering into a lot of different streaming platforms. Amazon will have it on at some point. Um, even if it's not on Prime, you can still, you know, pay the you know, two ninety nine an episode or whatever, or you can buy the whole thing for 30 bucks, but it'll be at Pluto. I think it's going to have in the spring. There's some other places too, man, but it's uh, we're definitely excited about it. And you can always go to YouTube and watch some of the preview episodes for free. Um, and we hope people do because uh, you get a lot of good peeks into what's coming. Yeah. I believe uh, Samantha had, had sent a few within the email. So I, I know yeah. I, I had clicked one. I uh, hadn't hadn't a clue who the author was, but it, it seemed very interesting. And, and yeah, I man, like, I like how the conversations keep flowing because that's well, and they take you right. Like I said, you're right in their writing rooms, right where they write this stuff, right where they create it. You're not on some set with like a it's kind of like you guys. You're right. You know, you're in your booths there. You're right in the middle of where you create. And it's not this 20 minute fluff thing. And, you know, I mean, yeah. so we're really hopeful that it, it format wise, I mean, I'm going to keep filming these. We're on hiatus right now. Cause I'm just overwhelmed filming these seasons. We owe oh, in the update. We have upcoming <laughs> three more seasons this spring about the author's TV season three, uh, which I mentioned some of those guests already. And then we've got about the author's TV Britain edition and about the author's TV sci-fi edition. We've got every one of the big sci-fi authors in the one and most of the big Britain authors, another working on JK Rowling right now uh we hope we get her and el james from the 50 shades thing but uh i mean serious but uh it's gonna be cool man it's gonna be lots of new content and we're just gonna keep barnstorming these series out and that's the fun thing about streaming is you just don't know what's gonna show up when but it's yeah. gonna be available out there and we're just gonna keep building out this catalog really aggressively because we think a lot of kids that would otherwise be watching these authors in a classroom or a lecture hall or a book signing haven't been able to that was the original muse for the show was like let's bring that out a lot of people are doing this in different formats podcasts and that but for streaming tv i think we're probably the first episodic q a television uh, uh format series but that's you don't have any commercials you don't have to worry about any beautiful. unless you're on pluto that's a, that's a huge seller you know <laughs> you know what i think though it is kind of cool though if you're watching it on one of those where they do have commercials and then the commercial mm -hmm. pops up and then i can see like wow all right this is real it's legit it's legit yeah so. i love commercials yeah right i love them on youtube because when our episodes or preview episodes are placed as an ad before with a click thing mm -hmm. that's been really helpful because we can go right in front of a podcast god bless google ads um it's not robots these people place these ads right in front of a related subject it might be a dune podcast and you're going to see kevin j anderson's episode nice. and the great thing about youtube is that they dump every click that's 30 seconds or less. So in other words, if you're not actually engaging and watching some of it, they don't count it. So it's a legitimate, it's a, it's, I'm, it's, I'm learning every day how this stuff works. It's a legitimate metric for 
initial interest for us. We want people to be watching the whole episode, but right. even if they watch 10 minutes of it and they say, I'm going to come back and bookmark that they might be running one day or, and that's the other thing, man, that we hope people do is like, you might want to watch an episode a day while you're on the, the, the exercise bike or something like that, or in the car on the way to work, you watch one on the way, one on the way home. It'll last you a month. I mean, if there is enough content there that it'll keep you entertained. I don't, I don't maintain this dad bod on an exercise bike. But yeah. I do have time to listen. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Whatever you want to do, take a bath. The yeah, fall asleep. I mean, I, although I am in no way putting myself or them in the the echelon of uh, Bill Curtis and uh, Keith Morrison. Isn't that interesting that more people fall and that Peter Thomas and did Friends Pals? More Americans fall asleep listening to true crime than any other genre. Is that crazy? So Maybe I do some crazy dreams. I'm falling, <laughs> funny, I don't have them. I just, uh, uh, there's a show I watch called American greed. Um, the Stacy Keach from Cheech and Chong hosts. Uh-huh. And, uh, he just talks about these white collar scum fucks that like rip off grandma and grandpa <laughs> and they eventually get caught and go to jail for 30 years. And hopefully, you know, you know, the boys take care of them up there for ripping off their grandparents. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I believe in vigilante justice. I think that, yeah. uh, there's not enough of it, but it's funny that most Americans fall asleep, not by, by statistical majority with like, when they dismembered the body, they put the hand in the wrong compactor and that's how they found it. It's like, but <laughs> somehow the cadence of the voice is what's actually yeah. making you fall asleep. It's You're good. not actually remembering the content. And the it's calm, like, soothing voice. I calm. asked John Douglas about that. Really that. I'm like, what is that about? He's like, well, <laughs> Keith Morrison could read the phone book and you'd, you know what I mean? And you and you'd fall asleep to them. Yeah. I, I definitely think they may not be listening in the forefront, but their subconscious is picking it up. So one day they're going to like try you know, <laughs> and dispose of a body and they'll be like, you know, what? I think we should do this. I don't know why. Yeah. But I, I think this is what I we got this do. feeling. Yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a Sopranos episode, which I'll confess is my favorite show. And it's near the end of the series. And uh, this fat Dom Gamiello guy comes over and the fight starts and Carlo and Sil kill him in the in the back of the butcher shop. And the historical way on that show that they got rid of bodies is they wait till it closed and they would go into Satriel's kitchen and turn on the saws and, you know. Yeah. And he's like, eh, no more of that DNA. You know, <laughs> like, so, yeah, I think, it, I think it filters down into into that. But um, anyway, hopefully this show's not about serial killers, but you can still listen to it at any time, morning, noon, night. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it and find something uh, entertaining in it and inspiring in it. And if you're just starting out, man, any age, you know, uh, it's a how to guide to write a book from the perspective of 54 of the best selling authors in the world across every genre you could or could not care about. And yeah. you might listen to one you don't think you would really care about from a reading standpoint and learn quite a bit about the process from it because it strips it down from kind of your interest and just to, gives you a different angle to, or if you're trying to write, you're trying to write suspense or thriller. I mean, how many, a lot of these authors talk about it, like five, six, seven books they threw away before they ever got to the one that really got them, you know, the, found their voice. So it's like, it's a lot of trial and error. So you learn a lot from them, uh, mm-hmm. even as successful as they are, you learn a lot about the struggles getting there. Yeah. That's cool. Well, I, I'm I'm super excited and excited to check it out because I Same. It, you have like incredible guests. Authors yeah, man, that was the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Who would care if you were just sitting there listening to me? It'd be like, you know. <laughs> so I thought I thought let's let's like and or if you were listening to ten minutes, you'd be like, gosh, that sucks. I wish there had been another hour of that. And so we thought, <laughs> you know, let's get two hours. Let's get uh, let's talk about the book that didn't sell but that they love the most. I do that with songwriters quite a bit, and that's. Yeah. A, trick to get them to tell me about the hit they're tired of talking about in greater depth because they want to talk about the song that they wrote about their dad or right. they wrote about this or that or the other thing and and it's sometimes the best work um so anyway well thank you for having me guys i really really appreciate it and uh, we we're grateful for any yeah, any yeah, promotion course, yeah we'll be sure to uh to link up with you and uh and I'll give you samples. I can give you uh, episode clips if you want to work any audio into it, just so it's not just don't take it from my my word for it. You can hear it right from the author's mouths too, Ooh. and watch it right from the author's mouths. You don't have to listen, so it's which is even cooler. Hello. Um, awesome, man. Well, you guys do great work. I appreciate it, and uh, hope Thank you guys you. have a great rest of your morning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you All as right, well, buddy. Stay mindless. Stay mindless out there. Thank you for listening to the Mindless Morning Show. We appreciate you picking us out of the many great podcasts out there. 
Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that little bell to get notified whenever we release a new episode or bonus content. Now go enjoy the rest of your mindless day.